Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, to the second session. So just to quickly recap, we just went through a, a bunch of verses from um, of how worship was organized uh, and expressed uh, in the first temple, a temple that was built by uh, Solomon and also uh, in the initial days of David. And he was bringing the ark back. Okay. Uh, now let's just go into uh, the second section, which is in page 10, how a worship was organized in the second temple. Um, right, so just a, a brief, uh, it's not a history lesson uh, or anything, but uh, uh, the second temple was, it's after, after, the, so after Solomon's temple was destroyed by Babylonians and they were all taken into exile. They were there in exile for 70 years and it was in between that uh, they kept coming back to uh, the build the temple. But just for us so we understand, um, let me just share the screen if I can. Um, just a simple timeline uh, image for us to get a better understanding. <coughs> Okay, I think this is too big, but anyways. Uh, so you see uh, the first temple uh, period here, right? Solomon's temple, it was from 968 BC to 568 BC, and which was uh, destroyed by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, but you, you can ignore every other prophet's name that's mentioned there, or you can look at it. Uh, you have see the Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and during this period were contemporaries. Um, then you, we have right here the Babylonian exile. Hold on, yeah, everybody can see the image, right? Okay, cool. <clears throat> right. Yeah, right in the middle we see the uh, Babylonian exile at seventy years, and then um, after the Babylonian uh, ba Babylonian kingdom is overcome by the Persian Empire. Uh, then the Persian king Cyrus uh, agrees to let them go and build their temple. Then here we see this, the construction, reconstruction of the temple uh, by Zerubbabel. Uh, and that this temple, the second temple, it lasts for about, uh, the, the duration of this temple is for about, say, 420 years. It just goes until that was, you know, again destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Okay, so... Uh, this is just a simple timeline. Um, I understand things visually, um, so it's thought I'll, uh, this helps me understand, okay, so this is what it is, because um, I know BC and AD can uh, get a little confusing. Okay, so BC is, the, as the numbers become small, you are approaching the middle and whatnot. So uh, yeah, images like this help me understand, so I thought I'd just share with you guys. Uh, Okay, I'll stop sharing the screen now. <clears throat> so that's what was happening. Now, one of the things, uh, you know, uh, after um, there's one significant thing that happens to the people of Israel during the time of exile, which we'll talk about in the next section. But uh, let's look at the one scripture verse there in page 10 from Ezra chapter 2. Ezra chapter 2. It says, because uh, they returned with 128 Levitical singers, the sons of Asaph. Right? Uh, Ezra returned with 128 Levitical singers, the sons of Asaph from the tribe, clan of Asaph. And then Ezra chapter 3, verse 10 and 11 is what it says. Ezra 3, 10 and 11 states that, Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with the trumpets and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with symbols to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. Okay. All right. Okay, so halfway through, we have a question from Elisha. Why was the temple always an object of destruction anytime Israel is attacked? Well, I think everybody knew that uh, temple the, was a holy place, isn't it? That's something that uh, the Jews uh, held it in a very high place. It was, uh, and that would happen not actually 
not only Israel, but any country, you know, uh, invades another country, one of the first things that they normally attack is the place of worship, they destroy the place of worship. Uh, and it also, you know, establishes something is like, okay, you are to follow my ways now, you are to do what I tell you to do, you are to worship the God that I tell you to worship, right? And what happens uh, when the Babylonians take away, uh, destroy Solomon's temple, um, you know, they take Daniel and and all his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, one of the first things that they do is uh, they change their names, isn't it? Uh, and they change their names, isn't, they're giving them a different identity. That means you are no longer yourself. You belong to me. You will carry the name I give you. And then now you will worship the God I tell you to worship. You are to worship my God, right? Uh, so worship was a huge deal uh, among people of those days uh, as well. And they knew how important uh, the temple was. And not to, to say the least that this temple that Solomon built was beyond grand. It was beautiful, right? The way the Bible describes it, it the amount of gold that was used uh, to just build the temple. It, it, it would have been the first wonder, second wonder, third wonder, fourth wonder, fifth wonder of the world. It was if it was still there. And um, and so I'm not surprised as to why that was easily attracted and destroyed by Babylonians. In fact, actually, there was one time with Tarun actually did a session for our youth uh, on on Solomon's wealth. And if you start talking about that, we'll keep talking about it. But I hope that answers your question, Elisha. Yeah. Okay, you're yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's continuing on chapter 3 of Ezra 10 and 11. It says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. Right? Talk about being order being set, culture being set, even after 70 years in exile, when they're coming back to build this thing, uh, the temple, they're following the directions that King David had set. They sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, a couple of things that stands out is that they still remember what was followed back in the day, right? 70 years is a, uh, quite a long time for people to forget, isn't it? Yes, no. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time for people to forget uh, some of the practices, uh, the ways that was, uh, good practices that was done. And they remembered the instructions of King David and they followed uh, in that instructions. Another contemporary prophet during the time uh, of Ezra was Nehemiah. And Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27 to 43, I'm not going to read that, describes in detail the inauguration of the wall of Jerusalem with the grand processional of two groups of priests and Levites who marched in opposite direction on the wide wall, blowing the trumpets, singing and playing the cymbals and plucking their nevels and kinors. Nehemiah 14, 12, 44 and 46 says, On that day, men were also appointed over the chambers for the stores. Okay, look at those words there. On that day, men were also appointed. Okay, uh, we are coming to a conclusion of this section, guys. But remember that there was order, right, in everything that they did, right? They stood in a certain place. They, uh, they did a certain thing. There was a certain group of people who were in charge only of a certain thing. Right? Uh, the musicians were not doing what the priests were supposed to do. The priests are not doing what the musicians were supposed to do. Everybody was doing their own thing. Um, right? So on that day, men were also appointed over the chambers for the stores, the contributions, the first fruits and the tithes to gather into them from the fields of the cities, the portions required by the law for the priests and Levites. And check this out. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who served. For they performed the worship of their God. 
and the service of the purification together with singers and gatekeepers in accordance with the command of David and his son Solomon. For in the days of David and Asaph, in ancient times, there were leaders of the singers, songs of praise and hymns of thanksgiving to God. Uh, right, so we don't see much of a change uh, or a difference between the worship that happened in the first temple and the worship that happened in the second temple. The reverence was there, the order was there, the culture was still being set, even after so many years of being in exile. Uh, it's very easy for us, of, for me, to use the word exile uh, because I've not been in exile, right? Uh, I'm not sure if any one of us, like, <laughs> you know, but we don't know what it does to people mentally, uh, physically, when you've been taken away from your place, when you've been treated differently. Uh, I'm not sure if you've had civil rights. Uh, when you think about all of these things and every external aspects that could have in, uh, affected them or had an impact, uh, but still, they did not forget uh, the ways and the instructions of worship. Uh, they remembered and they came back and they rejoiced and they worshipped. Just laying the foundations, uh, they worship. Building a wall, they worship. They ordered, they appointed. Okay, group one, go to the right. Group two, go to your left. And we're going to sing. We're going to go and march in procession and celebrate our God. Uh, right? So, um, hoping that there is something that we could learn of uh, the way worship was organized in the Old Testament. Um, right, so can we move on? Everybody okay? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes. <laughs> All right, so the next session. Yes, sir. Right, thank you. All right, the next section it talks about, uh, we can't finish the or talking about worship in the Old Testament and not talk about the book of Psalms. Amen. <laughs> Right, so uh, that's what this, this section is all about in page 11, is uh, a very simple way, uh, what the Psalms teaches us about worship, uh, right? I, I know, you, you know, we, we, we studied about worship quite uh, deeply in, in our first year, uh, and from Psalms and whatnot, but then I hope this is going to be a, a, a good reminder, much needed reminder. Right, so music and worship in the Psalms. Uh, what does it teach us? Uh, I love this quote, and that's why it's there by Martin Luther. He says, Next to theology, I give to music the highest place and honor. Music is the art of the prophets, uh, the only art that can calm the agitations of the soul. It is one of the most magnificent and delightful presents God has given us. And another quote by Henry uh, Wattsforth Longfellow. He says, yes, music is the prophet's art. Among the gifts that God hath sent, one of the most magnificent. It calms the agitated heart, temptations, evil thoughts, and all the passions that disturb the soul are quelled by its divine control. As the evil spirit fled from Saul and his distemper was allayed when David took his harp and played. Okay, um, so uh, with the Psalms, let's approach it uh, by asking these uh, five philosophical journalist kind of questions. Okay, if you can do that. Like who, uh, what, when, where, how, why, uh, right? So, but the what is already addressed. The what is music in worship. So that's the what we are going to address um, and how it was organized. So. One question is already addressed. So who? Uh, who is the psalm uh, is telling to worship? Uh, you know, who are to uh, worship God? Okay, everything that breathes. Psalm 150 verse 6, we know the verse. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Right? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. There's another verse that says, uh, praise looks good on us when we worship him and we choose to praise him right even things that don't breathe uh, let the sea roar and let the fullness thereof the world and that they 
they that dwell therein let the floods clap their hands let the hills be joyful together right um, I've mentioned this before that of all the creation God has created uh, we are the only ones the human beings are the only ones with a choice that we make to worship him every other creation does not have a choice right like we just read the seas roar uh, the mountains melt like wax in the presence of the Lord the trees of the field clap their hands in worship Psalm 19 uh, verse 1 and 2 says heavens declare the glory of God day and night they pour forth speech without stopping but then it is us the ones with the breath that we choose that we have this privilege to choose to praise him so who are to praise him everything that has breath right and Psalm 100 verse 1 to 5 I just want to read that verse uh, read that Psalm shout for joy to the Lord all the earth who all the earth okay worship the Lord with gladness come before him with joyful songs know that the Lord is God it is he who made us and not we ourselves we are his people the sheep of his pasture enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever his faithfulness continues through all generations amen so that addresses the who and the next question is where are we to worship right so uh, Psalm 149 verse 5 says let the Saints rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds Okay, so what does this mean, Roshan? Uh, where? Okay. Well, it simply means everywhere. Okay, wherever you are, uh, you know. Jesus later in the Gospels we see that he says in John chapter four, it says a time is coming uh, where a place is not going to matter, right? Because Father is seeking something beyond uh, a place of worship, right? So where? Um, everywhere on your beds while you're eating going doing life uh, like the scripture that I shared last week from Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 from the message version it says take everything right you're going out going to work coming in uh, you know everything that you do uh, in life let it be as so because you're doing it unto God so that's the where uh, we address the who the psalmist teaching us where and then let's see uh, what the psalmist has to say about when do we have to worship him is there a set time uh, you can worship him only a certain period uh, this is the window oh, let's see in the morning my voice shalt thou hear in the morning O Lord in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up <coughs> I like these translations so that's why they're here so um, I will awaken the dawn Psalm 57 verse 8 it is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name O most high to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night right so when are we to praise him in the morning in the noon in the evening right all day right Psalm 34 says uh, praise him continually let your praise continually be on your lips right <clears throat> all let it be on your lips all the time in every season praise him I will extol the Lord at all times his praise will always be on my lips I will praise you as long as I live May they always say, the Lord be exalted, who delights in the well-being of his servant. My tongue will speak of your righteousness and of your praises all day long. Right? All day long. One of the most important instruments that we use to worship God is our tongue. Isn't it? 
Yeah, and Psalm 34 says that uh, let his praise always be on your lips. Uh, you know, I will, my tongue will speak of your righteousness and of your praises all day long. I just want us to remind us of what uh, it says. Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 24, I think. It's the Father seeking worshippers who will worship him in spirit and in truth, right? In spirit and in truth, right? Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 18 says, Be filled with the spirit, right? Be filled with the spirit. And then what? And then we see in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, when God pours out His Spirit, what is the first thing that He takes control of? On the tongues. day of Pentecost. Tongues. tongues. Right? The first thing God takes control of when He's pouring out His Spirit is the tongue. And so, I can't emphasize enough, I can't stress enough uh, of, of this instrument that we use to worship Him, our tongue. Uh, is a is a is a beautiful sign and a fruit that we know that we are filled with uh, with, with the spirit of the living God is that we uh, we are continually using that to worship Him to honor Him to bring glory to His name. Okay, so Psalm is saying, when are we to praise Him? In the morning, in the noon, in the evening. Okay, like that old song that says, from the rising of the sun to His going down of the same. But you know the song, a Sunday school song. I love it, right? So, um, the next uh, question that we'd like to address is how? How are we to praise Him? Praise the Lord with harp. Make music to Him on a ten-string lyre. Psalm thirty-three, verse two. Begin the music. Strike the tambourine, sound the ram's horn. Make music to the Lord with the harp and the sound of singing with the trumpets and the blast of a ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Okay, if you're here and if you're wondering, saying, it's like, okay, you know, all those verses saying, are saying to play the harp, the lyre, I don't play an instrument and whatnot, but we just spoke of how our tongue is an instrument and it goes on to say, shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Right? Uh, Psalm 63 verse 4, In your name I will lift my hands. We worship Him by lifting up our hands. Let them praise Him, His name, with dancing. We clap your hands, all your nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. Sing to the Lord a new song. Okay. Um, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Okay, so we lift up our eyes. Okay, and there are numerous references. We, I can go on and on about all of this, and all of those references are there in your notes for you to just dig a little deeper and uh, do your own study. So um, that's that's what the psalmist have to teach us. Uh, the psalm, the book of Psalms, have to teach us about uh, worship and and uh, and how it was organized in the Psalms. Right. One more time, if we can just do a quick recap, who are to worship everything that breathes, even the ones that don't breathe, worship him. How much more should we? Where? Everywhere. When? All the time. How? Just find a way to praise him. Clap your hands, dance, sing, shout for joy, paint. Uh, you know, the list doesn't end there. Okay. So anything that you do that you can do that God's gifted you with, uh, do it unto him. Right. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, you're with me. Any questions, any thoughts uh, that you want to share? It kind of stands out. Okay. Okay, so can we move on to the next section? Um, worship in the New Testament. Okay. 
Great. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. OK, so uh, we finished uh, You know, just looking at very briefly uh, how worship was organized in the Old Testament from Abraham all the way to David and uh, Ezra and, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and the book of Psalms. Uh, we'll very, again, very briefly look at how worship ministry was organized in the New Testament. Um, worship in the synagogues. Now, once again, a very simple uh, history uh, recap is this idea of synagogues, right? Uh, which, as we know, it simply means church now. Uh, it People started following this while they were in exile. When I say people, people of Israel. Okay. Well, they were in exra, uh, exile in Babylon. There's no temple for them to meet, to worship, or you know. Th there's no temple. Uh, there's no place of worship for them to go to. So what they did was, uh, again, this is what the scholars and the historians uh, say that the idea of small groups. I'll use the word small churches. Right, uh, small groups, cell groups, um, started growing. And uh, it, was, it kept growing even after they came back and even after they built the second temple, as we just as we saw, uh, you know, which during the time of Ezra, Nehemiah and Zerubbabel, uh, these small group things continued and it, it, it took its full form uh, by the time during Jesus's time, it was the advanced, like it, it, it was in its full form, like the synagogues were there. Um, and so this the section of uh, you know this worship reading psalms to one another was followed even by the early church the first century christians because the first century christians were also jews right uh, so it shouldn't be surprising that uh, that you know they're christians and why were they following the ways of the jews because they were they were still jews uh, but they were just following uh, you know the way of jesus okay uh, I just want to read for us uh, a couple of things. Give me one second. Let me see if I can try and share a screen. Okay. Okay, as I'm not able to open that file. Um, okay, sorry about that. Okay, uh, if we guys come down to page 14, page 14 in your notes, uh, a lot of passages that uh, you know talk about how the first century Christians uh, who were Jews uh, continue to follow um, the traditions uh, and the practices of the Jews. Right? In Acts 2.46 says that early Christians were day by day continuing with one mind in the temple that was built, right? Acts chapter 3 verse 1 records that Peter and John were going to the temple because it was the hour of prayer. Acts 5, 21, 42 shows the continued practice of Christians going to temple on a regular basis. Okay, uh, so uh, I want to try that again because it's, it's nice. Uh, okay, here we go. This is a video of uh, from of a modern synagogue of uh, Jews meeting uh, in a synagogue and how worship took uh, you know takes place. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>
it's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's um, yeah. So uh, that's how synagogue uh, was organized. Right? It would be like pretty much in in a square shape where people would sit around, uh, you know, on the steps, kind of a thing. And then uh, a leader or a rabbi would read from the scriptures, and they would, you know, sing songs, hymns, uh, and they would echo that back. And that's how pretty much, uh, you know, worship at the synagogues were organized. And the singing, and the importance of singing in the New Testament is also emphasized time and time again. Um, right? There's this one uh, quote from Ronald Allen. Uh, in his book, uh, Worship, Rediscovering the Missing Jewel, he says, when a non-singer, okay, when a non-singer becomes a Christian, he or she becomes a singer. Not all are blessed with finely tuned ear and well-modulated voice, so the sound may not be superb. It may even be out of tune and off-key. Remember, worship is a state of heart, Musical sound is a state of art. Let this, let's not confuse them. Uh, so the critical question is not can you sing, but does your heart have a song? Okay, but does your heart have a song? Um, that's all in the notes, by the way, guys. Okay. Um, so time and time again in the New Testament, we see singing has been um, emphasized. It's not just in the Old Testament. It's not just in the Psalms that says sing and whatnot. Uh, we see Paul and Silas singing in, while they were in prison. And even, you know, Matthew chapter 26, verse 30, Matthew chapter 26, verse 30 says, that when they finished their last supper, uh, before they went up to the Mount of Olives, uh, they sang a hymn. Right, uh, Romans chapter fifteen verse nine says, "And that, that, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is as it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name." First Corinthians fourteen fifteen says, "What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with." understanding and a very famous uh, popular and well-known uh, scripture is Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19 following verse 18 that says be filled with the spirit and then goes on to say speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs okay speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs uh, from the video that we just saw that's exactly what is happening, isn't it? Uh, as in, they are singing it out, and there's an echo of it, right? So they're singing it to one another. They're worshiping God by doing so, uh, right? And another very key scripture is Colossians chapter three, verse sixteen. Colossians three sixteen. It says, "Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom." teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Okay, so the, the instrument here in, in Ephesians 5.19, okay, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19, and Colossians chapter 3 verse 16, 5.19 says, okay, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, and making melody, in your heart, right? So the instrument there is your heart. And similarly in Colossians 3, 16, it says, okay, while you're doing little wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So coming, going back to that quote is, the question is not, can you sing? The question is, does your heart have a song? Okay, so Maxon is saying, should we say there is uniformity between uh, synagogue and mosques, the way of services? Uh, uniformity between, uh, is it similarity? Yeah, uniformity is a more strong word, I would say, but uh, it's, it's Middle Eastern kind of um, melody, isn't it? Like, it's all sound the same, I guess. Uh, but 
but I haven't been to a mosque or a proper Jewish synagogue. Maxon, sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but the only thing I can say is because they're from the similar region, the Middle Eastern region, uh, they tend to have the same kind of style of music, right? the way of singing. Like, like in India, we have Karnatic and Hindustani, and people from all over the world will know, okay, that's Indian classical kind of music. So, order of service, I have no idea. <laughs> Does anybody else know? Uh, they're, they're, they're different. Uh, yeah. Muslims, yeah. They, you go there, uh, you, you, you wash up, and then um, the Imam basically leads the prayer. So in the youth, you follow him, and then afterwards, you, 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 you say your dua, your, your, your prayer, and then yeah, you leave. Unless if it's on, on Friday, where he, he, he kind of preach. It okay. gives like a teaching, yeah, but it's yeah. different from 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 the synagogue. Awesome, and thanks, the, the ramming is just the culture, like you said. Right. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, Maxim. I hope you got your answer. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, but this is basically what it is, and how uh, you know worship was organized in the New Testament. The emphasis on singing, uh, and and singing to each other with word, and I think. That's uh, that. That was too. That was that. That is very important, right? Uh, this Ephesians five nineteen and Colossians three sixteen is two key scriptures that beautifully balance. Let the word of Christ rich in you dwell, you know, uh, dwell in you richly. The word is important, and then using that to sing songs and hymns to one another is um, is essential. So you can't have one without the other, right? So. Uh, and as you see, that the methods have changed from where we started, altars, uh, you know, the 120 trumpets and whatnot, and suddenly the groups have become smaller, but still they continue to meet in one accord, in one heart. Uh, that those are the principles, right? The fundamental aspects of historical worship is simply uh, music, prayer, instruction, Lord's Supper, Psalms, hymns, spiritual song, uh, meeting in one accord, they remain constant. Right. So, uh, with that, I want to stop uh, this session, and uh, we'll continue from next week on the Tabernacle of Moses. Yeah, Shri Kumar. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, I just want to know that um, how these synagogues were formed um, when it is. Uh, even that's also my question, like um, how I asked you the previous question. It's like uh, you know. Is it also uh, lawful according to the Moses? Right. Uh, so, uh, like I mentioned, is so when they, as the historians and the scholars claim that uh, it began during the time while they were in exile. Now, when they were in exile, they did not have a place of worship to meet. Right in Babylon, they did not have the tabernacle. They did not have a temple. Uh, they did not have a place like a common place of worship. And so they had to improvise, they had to come up with something. And so that's where these small groups kind of began, like meeting in someone's house or, you know, things like that. So, and that evolved and evolved and finally got a name called synagogue. And so they continued with that practice. Thank um, you, Pastor. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Uh, anyone? I hope you're learning something from all of this. Uh, <laughs> yes, Christopher. Oh, yes, Pastor. So I wanted to understand a little bit about you know the level of of you know, spontaneity um, and you know when the when the when the music gets you know sometimes you know away from you know what has been practiced, what has been rehearsed uh, you know earlier. Um, I just wanted to kind of understand, uh, you know, what how it is in that moment, uh, because I'm sure that you know uh, you must have experienced it. Uh, you know, where there is it, it, it goes into a in, into a different, you know, uh, uh, realm of uh, you know um, closeness with God, and uh, uh, but it's also uh, not been rehearsed to practice before. Um, so just as an aside, I mean, I I come from a background of you know having having listened to a lot of uh, secular music, yes. and um, 
you know, in 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 a, in a live show, for example, uh, you know, those musicians would you know go into sometimes a uh, 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 you know times where they have you know just you know doing their thing, and you know, yet it's all sort of you know appearing uh, sounding very uh, very very much. Uh, Rehearsed. You know, well, uh, well, uh, you know, very much in tune, okay. but it's, it hasn't been rehearsed. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, just wanted to understand, um, uh, you know, how that moment is. You know, when, uh, you know, uh, when it's very spontaneous and very, uh, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, extremely sort of, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's, 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 it's it must be a very fulfilling moment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Christopher. As a, so, uh, what I'd like to. Uh, um at least try and distinguish is um the difference between a spontaneous and prophetic worship right spontaneous and prophetic moments of worship um the fresh thing that's in my head is what happened day before yesterday sunday at uh, I, our church is uh halfway through the worship uh the sound system stopped working <laughs> uh you know there are about i don't know how many people in the auditorium 400 or something uh, the mics stopped working, the speakers stopped working. And uh, at that moment, um, I was like, okay, what do I do now? And so I was put on the spot, <laughs> right? So, uh, so spontaneously, I had to change uh, the songs per se and sing songs that are familiar to people because I did not have a mic to amplify my voice. So I can't shout, uh, uh, you know, and sing uh, that would strain my voice. So the simplest and the, what I thought was the smartest thing to do was okay, just introduce a hymn, let people sing. So that's spontaneous. We didn't rehearse that. Uh, like, so there were like a couple of songs, very old familiar songs that we sang. Uh, so that's a spontaneous moment of worship, uh, you know, that you don't rehearse, that was not rehearsed, and which, which I thought was, was okay, you know, was fine. But then there are prophetic moments of worship, right? When uh, you're just leaning in a little bit more to hear what God is doing in that moment, uh, you know, the rhema word. And if he's, if he's speaking or putting something in your heart, uh, you release those words. And so that becomes a prophetic worship. Uh, and as you mentioned, it's definitely, uh, you know, fulfilling because it becomes fulfilling. One, not, it's not because you're trying to do something in your own strength. Uh, or your talent or your gift, uh, but you are depending on the leading uh, of the Holy Spirit. And so when you're dependent on that, uh, it becomes beyond fulfilling. I hope that answered. Okay. All right. Okay, everyone. Uh, well, thank you for joining today's class. I hope you had a good time. Uh, God bless you. Uh, have a lovely rest of the day and rest of the week. I'll see you again next week. Okay, guys, take care. Bye bye. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.